hello. I'm here with Lisa Wiedemann. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so the first time I said Wiedemann, I think, and then I had a couple of people from your group correct me and I appreciated <laughs> that. The first time I heard about you, Lisa, it was at my last retreat and I was talking about special guests and multiple people said, do Lisa Wiedemann. And I was like, who is that? And it was so funny because that same day you said something about my retreats. Um, you had seen it on Instagram and you said something and I was like, oh, this is Lisa. And um, people were just saying such awesome things about you. They're like, yeah, she is older and she walks around on the beach in her bikini and she looks awesome and she's so smart. So I have been a fan since then, since just discovering more about you through your Instagram platform, but I don't really know much about you. So first of all, welcome. And thank you for spending your time to be here. I know that you are very busy and you help so many people. Um, you stay busy. You're usually on a treadmill. So I see you're sitting down, which takes, <laughs> takes time out of your day. Um, so would you mind just sharing a bit about who you are, where you're from, and um, and how you got into the role that you're playing now in, in these groups that you do. Yeah, so thanks for having me. It's just such a pleasure to, to speak with you. I am a optometric physician. I've been in practice for 32 years now, seeing lots and lots of eyes. And um, we can get into that as how that has evolved as I've come into this whole carnivore world too. But um, yeah, so I have been, I'm, I'm 58. <laughs> I've been carnivores for 14 years and wow. it, it's really one of those things where, you know, as, as we go through life, it's, it's just a very, very interesting path that how we get to this spot. And I'm so interested in, in, you know, I host groups of, um, I, I try to get people together because it's so important when you're doing something that is so it look, it's looked upon as so extreme and so far out as the, or out of the ordinary. And I try to place it where, no, we're the ones that are eating normally, everybody else out there eating pizza and hoagies and fries and chips are eating the weird way because, um, we're, we're not really intended to put any of those foods in our bodies. So um, I came to this because I had a very, very long lifetime. <laughs> I call it a lifetime is at least 30 years of, um, you know, when I look back now and look at it, but of carb addiction, sugar addiction, eating disorders, um, volume eating disorder, binge eating. I mean, you name it. And I could not figure it out. I was like, you know, I'm a smart woman. <laughs> I don't know why I, I can't figure this out. Why can't I stop doing this? And it wasn't until I came into, uh, you know, at first it's like the typical learning, figuring out about low carb. And I was so fortunate because that would work to a certain extent. Like I, I did paleo and, you know, it was, that was eliminating sugars and grains. And it really was interesting though, because on paleo, you know, you could eat dried apricots and fruit and well, guess what? I could binge on that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I just kept going in and out of the, what I call the ditch and, I was so fortunate to happen upon, this is way back before Facebook and Instagram, <laughs> um, a, 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 a forum that was just on the internet that Charles Washington was running, awesome. so zeroing in on health. And they were an offshoot because they got kicked off of um, a low carb forum because they, were a, they made themselves a thread in that forum and then got themselves kicked off of this low carb forum. And he formed this group and it was life-changing for me because it was a group where people who were in there, it was just a small group. I think it was 60 or 80 people were writing about how they did Atkins induction, which is basically carnivore and that it worked so well. And it didn't work once they started climbing the carb ladder that they all just said, let's just keep doing carnivore. Well, they, we just called it zero carb back then. And they um, were, 
people were just keeping journals of their experience and why they were there and people, you know, resolving themselves from obesity, from diabetes, from uh, bipolar, from wow. disorders. And I was like, and I'm sitting there reading this, this one night, and it was um, March 8th, 2009, because I know for sure March 9th, 2009 was day one for me, where I said, wow, this is powerful. These people are in here writing about all these positive changes. And specifically, I'm so grateful to, um, in particular, these two women who were writing that were had found this and said, this has relieved themselves of, of their carb addiction and their eating disorder. So that was really the start of it for me. And I thought, well, heck, this seems a little crazy. This can't be healthy. I don't know. Like, you know, I was like, really? I can... So, but I said, you know what, I'm going to jump in and do it and continue to do my research as I did it. And I can always change, change path. And it was so great because they put in um, all sorts of, everybody was looking into the, the Stephenson, the fat of the land book. We, you know, mm. we discussed that. Uh, Owsley Stanley, the bear who had been eating this way for at the time, I think like literally 40 years and there was writings from him. Um, so on and on, not by bread alone, all this stuff. And I was like, wow, not only, not only is this like totally changing my life, my life and helping me, but it's actually the healthy, I think it's the optimal way that we should be eating. And um, so it's interesting because when you get to this point where you, you, you find out about this and you learn how we've been deceived and how that there's just so much misinformation out there about the whole cholesterol thing and just so much that it's like, wow, every, I wish I found this earlier. You know, I wish I'd yeah. known about this. And you get angry that that the information isn't out there. And people keep wanting to hear, well, where's the study that shows that this is healthy? Where's the study? Well, nobody's going to make money telling you to eat meat and drink water. And so where's the funding for that? You know, and I, you know, I, I think part of it for me is just telling people and, and, you know, <laughs> I think the hardest part is, is being in the position where you feel so good, but you have so many naysayers around you that are telling you, no, you're going to have a heart attack. No, you shouldn't be feeling so good. What do you mean? You don't eat fruit and vegetable. That's, that's one of the most difficult things about this, I think. And that's why just it, it led me to then years down the road, you know, nobody really wanted to hear about this 14 years ago. You know, I would right. talk about it because I wanted to shout it from the rooftops, but yeah. I learned to just zip it up because, you know, unless you really, you know, have your own personal reasons for coming to this, it's, it, it doesn't, it falls on deaf ears mostly because nobody wants to give up their food. And most people don't want to admit that it's actually a, an addiction. And I think to different degrees, people have carb, sugar, processed food addiction. And the people who don't think that they're addicted to it, I say, give it up for 90 days and, and <laughs> tell me differently. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's always that, but yeah, yeah it's, uh, and, and that's why I, I ended up, it was just, I guess, three years ago now that I, I made an Instagram account just so that I could comment in some of these carnivore accounts that were coming out now, all of a sudden it's like, oh, well now we have a platform. And um, I said, you know what, let me, let me keep a separate account and have it so that I can follow my, my carnivore tribe, you know? And I started making comments and people were asking questions because I had done this so long because everybody says, this can't be sustainable. This can't be healthy long-term. And I was like, uh, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> me, there's Kelly Hogan, there's Charles Washington, there's, you know, Dana Spencer. There's a lot of us who have been, Amber O'Hearn, um, yeah. been doing this for, for quite a while. And so I, I felt like I wanted to be, uh, I guess, representative of, of, yeah, you can do this and be healthy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on no medications. I feel great. And 
I'll add in, I am not an avid organ eater, but I do try to think about incorporating it because I do feel it's really healthy. I just don't happen to really like liver too much, but, um, mm -hmm. but just to be also to be one that says, you know what, I haven't eaten organs in 14 years either. And yeah. I've got healthy skin, hair, nails. I mean, uh, you know, I don't have scurvy. I'm, you know, but I th I think for what I, what I was really getting at, and I go on these tangents, but um, I felt it was important for me to um, form groups so that people could have a place to talk and to uh, feel that they're part of other people who have researched this like they have and to get the support and the accountability. If you're struggling with the fact that there's many of us who have a hard time transitioning to this way of eating because we love our fruit. Why? We love the taste of sweet, right? And so that that's really been a big thing for me is um, providing opportunities for people and, and the, to come together. And that's why I was attracted to you with your um, retreats, uh, because aside from my weekly meetings that I host, um, I I have been donned the queen of meetups because I have now hosted 25 meetups wow. where, yeah, I, I announce where I'll be eating and what day and when, and I get a group of people who want to join me. And so wherever I travel, I always host a meetup. And I also host every summer in New Jersey, uh, what I've done, the we're, we're going into the fourth annual Northeast meetup. So I have Kelly Hogan coming again and Dr. Kiltz and wow. Um, yeah. And, and they're, they're so powerful and like, just like I'm sure, and I'm, I want to hear a little bit more about your retreats because I have um, in, in the same kind of context of a multi-day retreat, I actually hosted what I call a carnivore boot camp uh, for a week. And I, I think about doing that, not, yeah. not so much, just, just to provide the opportunity to have an immersive situation where you can shop with me, eat with me, yes. work out with me, live the lifestyle and understand like you, you can do this and you can order in a restaurant and be healthy and you can um, avoid different triggers. And it's just really important to, um, to help people because this is such a, a very foreign thing. And when people walk away from the, the meetups I have now, this is just a between a two to five hour meal. They end up being people walk away feeling so empowered and yeah. it, 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 it just, I, I feel as humans, we want connection we want community. And when you find this way of eating in a sense you can lose that connection because food is so pervasive in our worlds, socially, whether it's holidays, even at work, the break room, you know, and going out to dinner socially with friends and so much surrounds around food and so much surrounds around the standard American diet of food that you become I don't want to say ostracized and ousted, and I, those terms are way too harsh, but you become to feel so different that you do feel in a sense that you've separated yourself. So that's why I, I between the groups and the meetups and the retreats, I think it's just amazing to be able to get people to, um, <laughs> to become their own tribe, to become their own um, your own identity and not like, like, it's not like it's a cult, like some people say, but you know, you could say that about other ways of eating too, but this is really just people who have health as their top priority, which we all should, but people who have gotten themselves to the point where they've researched enough, overcome the standard mass media messaging the brainwashing that we get about lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lean meat and meatless Mondays and all that garbage and, and got yourself to the point where you, you feel so good about what you're doing, but you feel rather alone. So that's, that's where the, the beauty of, of all of this 
comes in and I, I'm really looking forward to being in your part of your retreat. And um, I, I think that the, what you're doing is so powerful. Thank you. I think so many things you just said really resonate with me. The first thing is that you said you felt like you needed to become a representative. You know, you were like, hey, I've been doing this for 14 years. And that's what I felt like when I was delivered from over 10 autoimmune diseases, chronic C. diff, chronic Lyme disease. I gained 65 healthy pounds after being told I would be hooked up to a feeding tube and remove my colon. That's something that I couldn't keep to myself. And so I did notice, you know, there are some people in this carnivore community who are trying to gain weight, not lose it. And I felt like they were just, no one was talking with them. They felt like, okay, this is dangerous because I'm just going to lose weight. And I felt like I needed to be a representative to say, no, carnivore in this way of eating actually regulates your weight. It's a weight optimization diet, which Ken Berry says all the time. And it's true. Right. It will bring each of us to our healthy weight, whether that is exactly. having to gain it or to lose it. I, I, I'm really so um, interested in looking into all of the different facets of how this improves people's lives. And I love that specifically because about eyes, people write to me and say, you know, I came to this because I was trying to resolve my MS issues, but let me tell you, I was a glaucoma suspect. And now my eye doctor is telling me, you know, so I'm hearing all of these testimonials of eye conditions improving based on people coming to this for other reasons. Cause you know, that's why people come to me and say, well, will this help for, you know, dry eye? Will this help? Well, you know what? I don't have patients that sit in my exam chair who have, let's say even severe dry eye, who I say, Hey, you know what? Why don't you take on this carnivore way of eating? And let's see, like, they think I have two heads, right? So <laughs> it's not like I can prescribe that right. aside from the fact that it's not standard protocol and it's not standard of care. And I could literally lose my license over doing this kind of thing, but that's a whole yeah. nother discussion because it came to the point where I couldn't bite my tongue anymore, where I wanted to help all my diabetic patients who have bleeding in their eye and try to explain that, look, you can reverse this. You can halt the progression of this. Um, but it's been really interesting for me to understand that our bodies are meant to evolve and to yes. evolve, our bodies have to heal and be healthy. And to do that, they have to handle the toxins that are thrown at it. And unfortunately, living in America, and we're probably even Europe now, all over the world, we are yeah. throwing so many food toxins. And then you got to add in the whole glyphosate issue with the pesticides and, um, you know, you name it, the po pollution and all that. But our bodies from us putting in all these toxins for so many decades have, you know, developed all these diseases and problems. And and I'll throw in a, a, discuss, a mini discussion about macular degeneration because so many people are, um, are, are asking me, you know, will this prevent it? Will this halt it? Will this stop it? My mom's going blind from it. Can I help her at this point? And, you know, it's, it's so important to understand that a hundred years ago, this was so very rare. Macular degeneration was like mm -hmm. one in hundreds of thousands. Now, over the age of wow. 75, it's one in three people, one wow. in three over the age of 75, one in 11 people over the age of 55. And it used to be one in hundreds of thousands. So what's changed in the past hundred years? Mainly the introduction of processed foods and seed oils, yeah. Crisco, margarine, all those things that we were then told that we should be eating, told to decrease animal saturated fat that it's, you know, going to harm your heart and start eating all this other garbage. And it has just exponentially increased disease and macular degeneration being a, a, a main one. Our eyes are very metabolically active and mm -hmm. um, take, take up a lot of energy. So there is actually so much that is damaged from and, and, you know, realistically, we could say our health is everything about what we eat. So. Wow. I never, I never knew that, you know, I hear, 
I see posts and I hear things about heart disease, obesity, diabetes. Those are all new problems that we have, but I've never heard about macular degeneration. I had no idea how rare it used to be. Right. You know what? Here's the, here's the thing too. I'll just jut in here with that because it's actually, it was always called um, AMD, which is age-related macular degeneration. And so they were calling it that and that it was a disease, you know, basically much more commonly of the elderly, right? Mm -hmm. But there was just as many old people a hundred years ago, right? So yeah. it, has, it, it has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is this very sneaky, sly way of that bad food, those seed oils being in our body, they absorb into all our cells. There's a very, very long half-life. It'll take over eight years to get it out of your body. If you stop eating it right now, that's the stuff that over time starts taking its toll. And so they, you know, age-related macular degeneration is a misnomer. Um, it's not genetic either. Um, what's genetic is your grandparents and your parents we're eating certain things and then you started eating them and it's yeah. this kind of food in our, in our diets. But yeah, there's probably a little predilection for, you know, um, Scandinavian blue eyed women over, you know, there, there is some genetic, uh, connection yeah. that, that they're, that they have with that. But for the most part, what we eat is everything. Yeah, totally. Talking about seed oils, you know, you mentioned they can stay in your body for up to eight years and I always tell people seed oils are my non-negotiable. I'm okay eating a strawberry, um, but seed I will not touch seed oils. They, I know that they have a half-life of 680 days. And I learned from Dr. Ken Berry at my spring last spring retreat that in certain tissues, they can last up to 10 years. So depending on where they are in the body, like you just said, it can be eight years, it can even be 10 years. And it's just like, why would I ever indulge when something is going to be causing some level of inflammation to my body for that long. And there's nothing that you can do to, to get rid of it. Um, so that's definitely my non-negotiable. Do you have things that you'll consume, um, you know, on special occasions? Like for me, I do strawberries, I'll do berries. Now that my gut has healed and sealed, are you strict carnivore, no sweeteners ever, or do you ever do specific things and what are your non-negotiables? Yeah. So yeah, non-negotiables for me have come about through knowing myself and where I came from. And for so many people who I coach, <laughs> I try to emphasize my experience and how it was for me in that the taste of sweet is a non-negotiable because, um, and, and for a number of reasons, because when, even with the taste of sweet, let's say it, it hits the sweet sensors on the tongue. So let's say it's a, it's stevia that is signaling to the brain. Hey, some stuff's coming down here. That's sweet. We're going to have to start kicking in the insulin. We're going to have to kick in, um, to take care of this. And more so for people who have come from having eating issues with, um, let's just call it sugar, sweets, carbs, ice cream, cookies, cakes, all that. Um, it triggers that whole dopamine. It triggers that pathway yeah. and it's noise. It's so hard. I, I could never. And, and for me, I skipped way over the whole keto movement because for whatever reason, when I found this whole way long ago, first read about Atkins and then the, um, the paleo, and then hitting upon this zero carb group, I, I missed the whole keto movement, but for me, it would have been a, a total downfall. And it's, yeah. what I see in a lot of people who I coach is that you're so anxious to make the keto brownies and the keto cookies and the keto pancakes and the keto this, because you're trying to replicate those foods that you were so addictive because your brain is still wanting them. And it's so freeing just to get rid of it and say, you know what? I feel so amazing eating meat, seafood, eggs. Um, why am I trying to substitute this? And 
what's the purpose of it? I need to change my relationship with food. I need to, because I used to eat those things in times of stress, anxiety, loneliness, anger, boredom, whatever the emotion was, we, we go to certain foods to fill yeah. voids. And for people who have come from, been in my kind of world of where I've come from, um, there's, there, there is no substitute in, in the food world that's going to replicate that that's going to work. So um, it, it really comes down to changing the relationship with food. So the, the taste of sweet had to be a non-negotiable for me um, because I, I talk about so much that we're only two feet away from the ditch. Um, mm. there's, there's, there's a fine line that you walk when, and a very quick slippery slope when you're at a wedding and well, it's, it's, it's a celebration and it's just wedding cake. And then, well, then the next day it's like, well, all right, it's just a weekend. We'll get back on Monday. And then people find a hard, 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 horrible time trying to get climb out of the ditch. Um, so it has to, for, for many people, it has to be, you draw the line and it's just, it's not my food. It's not my food. It's not natural. It had to be manufactured in a factory and put in a bag for me to purchase to then put in this, you know, dessert. And I yeah. get it. Though, there's a place for it for some people who cannot mm -hmm. wrap their brain around um, just jumping into this way of, of life. Um, and there's a place for it for people who tolerate it and have no issue with it and have no history of binging. You know, it, you know, your situation coming from health issues is totally different from somebody coming from yeah. binge disorder, you know, so yeah. you don't, you didn't have that relationship with food. You just had a body that was deconstructing because of toxins getting put in, but you didn't have that connection with the food in a way that people who are addicted to it are. So, I mean, I look at it, um, as, you know, so, so what's non-negotiable for me is a negotiable for others and people who can moderate. I can't moderate, you know, and that that's the problem with, with addictions. You can't moderate yeah. alcohol or cocaine or heroin when you're an addict, you can't have a little bit of it every other week. So, um, that, that has to be for me. Um, but again, I, there's, there's so many people that have changed their lives in segueing to keto. And then I find a lot of people then end up segueing to carnivore because of, you know, hitting um, a, a plateau or a level yeah. or slipping back. So, um, but I'll go into what your original question really was, aside from that non-negotiable for me, um, is that I will, if I am having like tuna or salmon sashimi at a restaurant and they serve it with fresh cubed up avocado. I'll, I'll, I eat the avocado. It's like, I'm not like, I'm not dogmatic about this. I'm like, I, I enjoy it. I don't feel it's detrimental. Same thing with, if I get a beautiful charcuterie board and there's some, some amazing different varieties of olives, I'll have some olives. Sure. Um, but other than that, I'm going to say there's pretty much, oh, maybe a couple bites of a pickle. If a pickle comes on the plate with my bunless burger. Um, I don't think a, uh, fermented cucumber, uh, a few bites <laughs> twice a year is, is, is anything that, um, is a problem, but that's, you know, any, as far as going off of carnivore, that that's where it, it stands. That's so good. Um, what you said about, you have to know yourself and you probably don't know this about me. I did struggle with a binge eating disorder, after being held against my own will in an eating disorder unit. So I had the C. diff infection. My whole family thought I had an eating disorder. I was held at UNC Chapel Hill eating disorder unit to gain weight. And I got out of there and I lost all the weight again. And I had been keto for about 15 years. I was paleo and then I was keto. I'd never was on a standard American diet my whole life. And keto was my downfall. And so after I was in that eating disorder unit, they brainwashed us. They indoctrinated me with things like if you're reacting to gluten, then it's all in your head. And, and it really messed with me because my family didn't 
I felt abandoned by my family and friends. And so I was telling myself, you know, I have to gain weight if I want a relationship with my family and my friends. And that's when I developed a binge eating disorder. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like impulsive. It was very planned out. I would put towels on my couch. I would set up napkins and water and I would get as many keto foods and treats as possible so that I could try to gain weight. And I would stay up until 5 a.m. And I was so lost. I just, it came from emotional instability and a desperation to gain weight. Um, so when I discovered I had the C. diff infection, I, I went through that whole process of three fecal transplants and I still had it. And now I was addicted to keto treats. And this is, I think where a lot of people fall into with keto is, you know, I was eating like the peanut butter cups by quest and the protein bars and well, it says keto on it. So it must be okay. But like the ingredients are horrible. And, and I was literally in shackles. And so in May of 2019, I was in my third emergency room back to back because my electrolytes were all over the place and they were holding me in isolation because of the C. diff. I was literally calling in keto treats. I was calling like uh, grocery delivery places to deliver keto ice cream in the emergency room. I was that addicted. Um, and then I felt like God twisted my arm and convicted me and said, you are idolizing, you're trusting keto more than me. And I had to surrender it. And I, I was like, this is addiction. I have to give this up. So that's when I turned carnivore and I gained healthy weight. I reversed every diagnosis and here I am now. So I did go through a phase of binge eating. And when I reintroduced sweeteners, I had to do things like I came up with my carnivore brownie recipe and I couldn't keep the whole batch available. I had to freeze individual portions and put it in the bottom of my chest freezer to make it very difficult to get to. I would go for a 10 minute walk after every single meal because I would be tempted to keep snacking on sweet things. Um, and I think it is so important to know yourself. There were seasons where it was a horrible idea to have any sweets in my house, whether it be stevia or whatever healthy keto sweetener there is, it was a bad idea because it, it just derailed me. Um, but then they were helpful for me when I needed to gain healthy weight. And as I repaired my leptin sensitivity, I can tolerate them and I don't crave those things anymore. Um, but for someone who has had an addiction to food like yourself in a different way, I think it's so wise to make that a non-negotiable and you have to know yourself. I work with so many different people and um, some people will try like the, the prime protein by Equip Foods and they'll tell me, I don't think this is a good idea, Rebecca. And I'm so proud of them for telling me that because no one can make the decision for you. For you. you have to make the decision for yourself. Um, so that's awesome. I think that's good. And you can allow yourself to have avocados or pickles occasionally you know what's a trigger and you know what's not, and you don't flirt with that line. I really like how you said we're two feet away from the ditch. I love that because you're so right. It's a slippery slope. Um, it doesn't have to be carbs. Even the keto sweets, I think, are such a slippery slope. Um, what are the majority of people that you're working with? What, you know, what is the basic person that comes to you? Is it an older person, younger person, eating disorders, or is it just a blend of people who want to be healthy? Yeah, I think it's a blend of, of a lot of different things. Um, because it's, it's so interesting because I, I, I use the term that I heard and I'm going to give credit to, it was Christy code red Nichols. She uses this term, the why that makes you cry. And mm -hmm. it's, I, I, I ask people, what's the why that makes you cry? Because people don't just come to this like haphazardly, like, yeah, yeah, I, I heard about this at the gym and I thought <laughs> right. it was cool. I thought it was cool. So here I am. How do yeah. I do this? Like, that's, that's not what happens. Um, but a, a large mixture of, um, I'm going to say, at, you know, age is normally over, over 40. Cause it, some, I'm, I'm thinking it takes a certain amount of decades before somebody develops their why that makes them cry. Or like Charles Washington says, um, the lucky ones get fat because those are the people that have, they're, they're wearing their addiction and mm. they're looking for an answer. And wow. yeah. they were lucky because that's what 
gave them the trigger to look into this at typically a much younger age. Whereas um, if it, if, you know, you have to wait for your health to fail, it's, it's really, it's, it's the lucky ones get fat because they're, they're start seeking this out earl earlier. Um, yeah, a lot. I, I think because I'm pretty outspoken about the um, addiction part of it, that I, I do have a lot of people who are just having a hard time giving up that last bit of sweet, that last bit of fruit, that last bit of stevia. Um, and they keep relapsing. We call it relapsing back into yeah. the ditch and that, you know, oh, I, you know, I can go two weeks and then, you know, my husband brings home a bag of bagels and la la la, you know, it's all of this kind of thing. And it's realizing that, you know, if you want to get healthy, you just, you can't eat that stuff anymore. Yeah. I, I say, this is really the largest struggle I think for people to overcome when, when you're overcoming this type of, um, addiction, because it's always in your face. It, it yeah. is everywhere. You could buy a hammer at Home Depot and you go to check out and there's Kit Kats and M&Ms and Snickers there, right? You can go to a holiday event and say, you know, be so steadfast and say you're like three months into this, six months into this feeling great. And then somebody comes up to you, it's like, oh, Aunt Sue made your favorite chocolate mousse. And next thing you're like, oh, thank And you don't want to, you don't want to offend your host or you don't want to stick out or, or whatever it is, but it's really the, your addiction trying to talk you back into it because you make up any excuse. Yeah. And it's, it's very important. I I'll tell people like, you have to learn a vocabulary of what to say. You have to learn uh, mm -hmm. that you're, what you're doing is really healthy and right for you. And you can't, you can't second guess it or doubt it or else guess what? You'll be back in the ditch. Um, and really what, it, a lot of what I say is, is just telling people, they'll say, oh, are you still doing that meat eating thing? And I go, yeah. And I've never felt better. And then you change the subject or somebody will say, oh, that's right. You can't have this, right? I say, no, I can have it. I just choose to not eat it. It doesn't make me feel good. Yeah. And then nobody can really deny you the fact that you're saying you don't feel good when you eat something, you know, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of different situations and scenarios, but there's always a plan. You can always be, you know, eat ahead of time, know that you can go home yeah. and eat after you don't ever have to eat something at any particular time. Uh, it, it really, I, it's, it's amazing how nobody should really give a crap what you chew and swallow, right? They didn't care when I was eating Twinkies and ice cream and hot dogs and pizza, right? They didn't care. But now all of a sudden I'm eating an ancestrally appropriate way of meat, seafood, and eggs. And now all of a sudden I'm killing myself. Right? So <laughs> yeah. it's, very, it's very interesting. Yeah. I think a lot of that flack comes from defensiveness because when I tell people, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I don't feel well when I eat sugar and carbs. I just don't feel well. I'll be honest. I'll tell them my mood disorder starts to come back and I just don't want to live like that. Usually people actually get a little defensive and I didn't pick up on this uh, in the beginning, but I do now. And I think it's that they realize it makes me feel like crap too, but I'm addicted to it. So I'm going to keep eating it. It makes them uncomfortable. So you should also be prepared for that is people don't like to be reminded that they're not making the right choices for their health. A lot of people have chronic pain, mood disorders, skin issues, digestive issues that they complain about or take medication for, yet they're unwilling to do anything about nutrition. And I find that some people avoid me because they know that I'm probably going to say something <laughs> like, don't complain to me when you're not doing what you could be doing. Um, my own sister has severe epilepsy and she does not do keto. She doesn't, she doesn't like how restrictive it feels. And that was a lot of tension for a long time. And I've, you know, we're both adults. We've come to the point where it's her decision, but it never comes up anymore because, you know, it's gotta be her decision. And she already knows I'm going to tell her, look, don't complain to me about your life that you can't experience other things because this is your choice. Um, and that's really difficult. And I say it with love, but um, 
everyone's just in their own place, but it's important for you to have, like you said, to be prepared, to know what to say and to have your boundaries. Um, and if people overstep those boundaries, then you might have to cut off that relationship or create new boundaries. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I, I can think of a lot of people who struggle with food addiction, who needed more support than I could offer because I didn't struggle with it the same way that you have. And so now I know that I can point them to you and your groups. What do your groups look like? Do you offer nutrition counseling? Um, what does that look like? Yeah, so the, I, I keep the groups small. I do not have a room of 40, 50, 80 people. I intentionally keep them small because it's really important that they get to know each other and they get to interact and they get to ask questions at every meeting and bring up topics they want discussed. So that's first is that it has to be really small so that you're not just sitting there listening and taking in um, yeah. this noise. Yeah. It, it, you have to, you have to be able to really participate and and feel vulnerable, but feel like this, it's a place where you can finally, for the first time, talk about this thing, yeah. which is typically very secretive. Addictions love isolation. And, you know, it's the old eating in your car, throwing the wrappers out before you get home, waiting till people go to sleep at night, waiting till people leave, whatever it is, it's very secretive. So this is really these, it's a safe place. And it's not all centered on that, you know, that, that exact topic, but a lot of it is because a lot of people that this is what's key to this is staying on track and staying on track long enough to allow your body time to heal. And, um, but yeah, the discussions really, um, revolve around how to deal with your, um, social situations, how to deal with what people say to you, how to deal with your food choices when you're on a trip, um, mm -hmm. you know, just all sorts of things like that. And, and also uh, all sorts of different, what I call tools in the toolbox to get yourself through those white knuckling moments where you used to always turn to food and what to do instead. And in between the meetings, I have a private WhatsApp chat group that everybody in my three meetings participates in and they share links, they share recipes, podcasts they found helpful, books, um, even just reaching out, hey, I'm struggling right now. And I have people around the world. I have people in France, Japan, Australia, Switzerland in my groups, the UK. So there's all different time zones. So at any moment when somebody writes in and says, hey, I'm struggling with this, or I'm about to leave mm -hmm. for my daughter's bridal shower, you know, whatever it is, it's just a, a really good community to um, be able to work through. And I have some that have been, or they're coming into their second year now with me. I've done this for just over a year and um, they, they just stay on. And I, not, not that I equate it to an AA meeting, but it, it, it really becomes um, a very comfortable support that they're not getting otherwise in their life. Yeah. The family, the friends, the coworkers, most don't have a real, real good support system. So this, and, and many of them in my groups have now become actual true friends and have met up at some of the meetups. And it, it's just been a, an, an amazing, way to help people and to have people um, reach out and finally succeed. I, I love hearing like, you know, I started with you back in January. This is the first time in my life I've gone a year um, without falling in the ditch, feel amazing. And, you know, that it, it's, it's it very inspiring to me because I always said, if I could just help one person out of the ditch, out of the black hole that I was in, then I, I will, I will feel so grateful. And, and now the way that this has all kind of evolved for me, I'm, I'm, you know, over and over so thankful that I'm in the position that I can host these meetups and I can have these groups and talk to people one-on-one -on -one 
and because it, it's it's important it is so yeah. important really i can tell that you're thankful i can tell that you're grateful because a grateful person puts themselves out there and i mean i watch your instagram stories and i'm like this woman is happy to do this you're radiating you're pouring out and you share all the little details and that speaks a lot compared to other people who you know have to schedule the time that they're going to show their face on camera um, because they're going through something or they're not comfortable or they're not grateful. So, yeah. and, and I think, you. yeah, I think one of the important things too, for me, um, you know, I, I work part-time as an eye doctor now, cause I, I sort of actually already retired, but I'm, I'm still staying in that too. Um, but I, I don't have to do this. I, yeah. I'm not doing this to, I'm not selling anything. I'm not trying to make money. I mean, I, I, my, my groups have a fee just to cover my expenses. Um, I could quit right now and walk into the sunset. I don't, I don't have to do any of this. And I think that really comes across in that genuine desire, just truly to help and, and to, yeah, really, I, I, I think, you know, it's one of those things where you could say, well, I found my calling in life, you know, it sounds so corny, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's but that, that's how that's how I feel. I feel that um, it if you're not if you're not here for the for the right reasons, um, then that that will that will come across, you know. And I I think that for so many people, not being able to have a group to talk to is what has been their perpetual downfall. And like I said, that whole thing where addictions love isolation and until we actually realize that I, I, that we're no different than somebody trying to get off drugs or alcohol or nicotine. I mean, this is truly, I mean, you can go listen to presentations by Joan Ifland and um, Dr. Cywis. He's big on the whole addiction. He's carb addiction doc. Um, it's It's really a thing. This is truly something that has to be considered for people who are struggling and the biggest yeah. the, the best way out of a struggle is go go to one of like your retreats come to meetups go to um join into a group you know it doesn't have to be my group just join into a group and start um learning more because the more you learn the more empowered you feel and the longer you do this and the better you feel you're going to be the you're going to be the next person wanting to shout it from the rooftops <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Something Dr. Barry said at my last retreat to me personally was he's so glad I was doing these more intimate retreats because it leaves an imprint on someone. And I thought that was a good way to say it. People come to my retreats and they leave changed, whether it be a breakthrough with their blood sugars or they're just finally feeling comfortable to do this in a way that is sustainable. And it's because of those connections. It's because of the fellowship. You have a tribe. You have real life experiences, conversations, people that are in the same boat doing the same thing. And you've, you know, had a week of eating amazing food with health benefits. It's like, you know, what's not sustainable about it? But those connections are invaluable. So I love that you offer that and you recognize that um, I did not do well in isolation. I ended up binging and and doing things that were just so twisted and I was just alone trying to work it out by myself and if I had just had someone tell me you know like you can gain weight without keto treats like there's another way um it would have made all the difference for me and um so I'm just I'm really grateful for you I'm grateful that you reach out for this community that's what's on my heart and that is my calling as well um, so I'm so excited to spend time with you in the spring. Um, and thank you for being here. I hope that we can maybe have some more conversations, dig into, you know, what do you eat in a day and, and how many steps do you walk? How many steps do you walk every day? Um, well, I, I, I'm shooting now for 10,000 and yeah. partly, partly because I, I, I have, um, put upon myself a challenge to climb Mount Whitney this summer. Oh, the highest peak in the, in the U S wow. 
14,500 feet. It's 11 miles up and back to do it in one day is kind of a, a feat, but uh, you know, so I've been, so yeah, I've been, I've set myself a goal of, of really trying to do that. Um, yeah. And, and just for everybody that, well, the studies show if you walk 8,000 steps a day, every day that you've got an a exponential increase in your longevity, um, we got to keep moving and yeah. walking is so simple and getting outside. I mean, that's partly also what I do in my groups is I, I have it sort of all encompassing the, the whole lifestyle. And, you know, we talk about things about grounding and getting sunlight in the morning and in the evening and trying to spend more time outside. And um, some in the group will talk about fasting. I'm not a huge proponent of fasting, although I dabble in it just so I understand it for myself. I'm really trying to get as metabolically healthy as I can, which means really getting your fasting insulin below a five and getting your A1C below a 5.2, really, ideally. And, um, you know, what what little levers can you pull to try to see how we can change? I don't do well with um, trying to limit my food uh, because I, you know, I, I tell people this is totally not sustainable if you're hungry. I mean, yes. this lifestyle is not sustainable if if you're not happy with what you're eating mm -hmm. and you're and you're going hungry. You can't obviously you can't do that. So I think that you know, but fasting has its place, and maybe I'll evolve to say, well, maybe a forty eight hour fast once a month every month sure. might be awesome to do, and it might be a good reset, and it does help me think of more about my relationship with food and what yeah. hunger actually feels like. Um, but I think that most, most people, as you come to this way of eating, then I, I sort of call it like the peeling the layers of the onion. Like first we're getting off the, the, the junk food and we're coming down into a healthy way of eating. And then, then it's like, you know, getting rid of the plastic containers and just using glass. And then it's, you know, only using reverse osmosis water. And then it's changing your toothpaste and your skincare to beef tallow and, you know, yes. it's all this stuff, but it's really, it's, it's so awesome that, I mean, this is a grassroots bottom up effort because yeah. we're not seeing this stuff, you know, it's not going to come out because, you know, the media is, is run by pharmaceutical and food industry and politics, all that is involved. And you, you really have to learn this by, doing your, doing your research. And one of the, one of the great ways is just getting into a group of a whole bunch of people who have that same goal in mind, who have those same, um, that, that same, uh, what we call, I like the, to use the term epiphany addiction. That's what I say. You can cross addict only onto one thing and that's epiphanies. Like just be so hungry for that next. It's like, Oh, wow. I tried that. And boy, it made a difference. And, you know, it, it's yeah. just really, it's, it's a, it's a whole positive lifestyle, which is what is so, um, it's, it's such a wonderful way of life because it, it all centers around getting healthy and it all centers around then people wanting to help each other and, again, it, it comes down to, to having the connections and, you know, those actually, it's funny. I'm going to tell you, um, some, I, I also do one-on-one -on -one private coaching. I kind of actually had to stop for a while because it's too, too full at the point, but I had, was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with a gentleman who lives close by to the two guys that were just at two of your retreats, Buzz, and present Bruce, present Bruce. Yes. So just coincidentally, I mean, what a small world. So Buzz and Bruce at their home last night hosted the guy that I'd been coaching and two of his CrossFit buddies. So now it's the five of them. And so the guy that I coached asked if I would come on a, a, um, meetup zoom meeting while they were having their meal. And they talked oh, about, I love that. Great oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. And yeah. So this is what I'm talking about, about yeah. community and about connections. And 
it was very interesting because the the two guys that were there um the crossfit guys that had just come to carnivore about i think they're each a month into it based on the guy that i coach but they were they are they were lamenting to me how their wives were complaining about the all the the actually their wives started it with them and tried doing it with them and couldn't stick with it and now are complaining about the smell of meat in the kitchen smell of meat in the house yes. and I was like oh boy we gotta we gotta talk <laughs> <laughs> the things that come up that you have to you have to like work through and you know so yeah. but really interesting that's so cool that's yeah. so cool that's what I'm called to do is work out those little nitty-gritty situations um, interfamilial things. I love working with families and you, something you said earlier was like, you do the carnivore boot camp, I think you called it where you do the grocery shopping. And I do that as well. I've traveled to clients' homes who need that in-home in-person experience. I will literally hold your hand. We'll go to Costco. We'll clean out your pantry. And I think that's also something that we need to know about ourselves. Are you a hands-on learner or, you know, can you, we just do zoom calls or are you just someone who's a self learner and you can just listen to podcasts and do something and stick to it. I think that more people need that in-person approach and experience. I know for me, it's what leaves an imprint. It changes my life and it's support that is just getting further and further away from us. I think as technology advances, it's awesome. It's an amazing tool, but it's never going to replace that in-person fellowship. Um, so I'm so grateful that you're willing to travel. And, you know, I was watching you on a train last week and um, I just think it's incredible. Like you, you're not really making money doing this. You're doing it to help people. You're doing it because it brings you joy and you're having fun with it. So I really appreciate the example that you set for all of us. Um, yeah, and I'm where can everyone... Go ahead. I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to um, the retreat and getting to know everybody who joins in. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, just immersing in with people who live this lifestyle and can impart, you know, my, my experience, I, I'll do everything I can to help everybody get to where they want to be. I'm excited. I think that you're going to be you might be my favorite special guest just because I know that you'll be involved with us. And um, it doesn't seem like you like set yourself apart from people. Like I'm excited to spend real time with you. I'm excited to go on the beach with you and walk and have conversations, even not about food um, because that's a relationship that develops and it just helps us be more stable in life. So I'm looking forward to it. Where can everyone find you? Where are you most um, active? Are you on YouTube? Yeah, so really, I'm going to say mainly YouTube and Instagram. I have a YouTube channel, um, Carnivore Doctor, and I've actually just as of, I guess, I think I've done it a month now, but I have dedicated, um, I go on live every Tuesday night, 8 p.m. I saw that. It's awesome. Yeah, and I do... I, sometimes I do a topic and go with it. And sometimes I run it just as Q and a, but I always do, um, you know, questions from people who are tuned in and, and then on Instagram, I, I try to, as, as best I can, um, do some informative posts and, um, keep connected there. And then, yeah, so that's, that's the best way to contact me is either, I'm, I'm usually really pretty good about answering the DMs and the comments over on YouTube. So you'll be able to get in touch with me and um, I'll, I'll uh, forward um, my information for my okay. groups if you want to join into the group. Yes, absolutely. So I will link all of all of these uh, resources from Dr. Lisa in my description here. And please be sure to follow her on Instagram, follow her on YouTube, watch her stories. It, it warms my heart. I don't have time to watch stories on Instagram, but I do click into yours because <laughs> it always makes me happy and I really appreciate it. So thank Thanks. you so much for being here and I will talk with you soon. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. It's great seeing you. Bye. Thank you. you too. Bye.